Today, we dive into a world where ordinary civilians wage war against brutal Mexican cartels. No pros, just regular people saying enough. Brace for jaw-dropping tales that'll amaze, horrify, and challenge your perception of good and evil. Who are these people? There are many people there in the groups. Uh, they call the, themselves self-defenses. Auto defensas. When the criminal group known as Los Zetas took over the streets of Michoacan from the previously dominant criminal groups in the state, a local gang called La Familia Michoacana was formed to oust them and regain control of the area. This was when the term Grupos de Autodefensas, meaning self-defense groups, first came into play. However, in recent times, the term has taken on a whole new meaning, as ordinary civilians have decided to take matters into their own hands and stand up against the brutal cartels terrorizing their city. April 15, 2011, a significant self-defense event occurred in Chiran. A group of indigenous people armed with rocks and fireworks attacked a bus carrying illegal loggers armed with rifles and associated with one of the Mexican drug cartels. The indigenous people took control of the town, expelled the police force, and blocked roads leading to oak timber on a nearby mountain. This vigilante activity soon spread to the nearby community of Apopeo, where self-defense groups were established. From then on, the term autodefensas began to take on various forms, such as policia comunitaria, community police, or policia popular, people's police. However, that was just the beginning, as this movement merely laid the groundwork for numerous vigilante movements, where regular folks took it upon themselves to administer justice. And now buckle up, because we're about to delve into the lives of five civilians who waged war against the cartels. Number 5. The Good Doctor I attend to my patients every day from 7 in the morning till noon, but in the afternoon, I go to war. Michoacan, the fertile agricultural state in western Mexico, has been long embroiled in a war. The three main players in this conflict are a notorious cartel known as Los Caballeros Templarios, the Knights Templar, the Federal Police, and Mexican Army Forces, and the armed civilian groups that have emerged in Michoacan as well as other states due to the absence of peace and safety. Amidst this chaos, a moral leader has emerged from the ranks of these militia groups, Dr. Jose Manuel Mireles Valverde. 2013, the doctor played a pivotal role in organizing a self-defense force comprising vigilantes from various regions of Michoacan. Their mission was to reclaim control of numerous communities that were under the influence of the Caballeros Templarios and other criminal organizations. Dr. Jose's reputation in Tepal Catapec, where he had previously worked as a doctor, was highly esteemed. The people of the town loved him. From 7 in the morning, his clinic door swung wide open, and he'd keep at it all day, taking care of the people in his town without a break. But as soon as noon rolled around, a whole new reality kicked in for the doctor, cause, well, war had come knocking. Dr. Mireles played a crucial role in eliminating criminal activities from his town and several others, and his courageous stand against these criminal groups earned him national fame and admiration. He became the leader, spokesperson, and the face of self-defense forces. In an interview with the doctor, he revealed that he joined the self-defense group to protect his family from the clutches of the Knights Templar cartel. He had personally experienced their brutality when he was kidnapped by the cartel, who demanded a ransom for his release. Not only that, but they had also mercilessly murdered several of his relatives. Unfortunately, according to him, this wasn't the last attempt on his life. January 2014, our doctor turned vigilante hero faced a life-altering event when he was involved in a devastating plane crash during his journey to the community of Ziquidan. This unfortunate accident resulted in a punctured lung and the need for 48 screws to be surgically inserted into his skull. 
Just two weeks later, the Mexican government took decisive action to combat the escalating violence in Michoacan. They deployed the army to confront both the menacing cartels and the self-defense militias. Initially around that time, a video surfaced revealing Mereles in a severely wounded state. In this footage, he implored the self-defense groups to lay down their arms and collaborate with the army. However, a subsequent video emerged, showcasing a different side of Mireles, where he said that the self-defense groups would only give up their weapons if the army made sure that they were safe by stopping the Knights Templar cartel. This meant capturing or taking down the top leaders, like Servando Gomez Martinez, known as La Tuta, Nazario Moreno Gonzalez, known as El Chayo, Enrique Plancarte Solis, known as El, Dionisio Loya Plancarte, known as Tio Nacho, and others. Mireles later revealed in an interview that the initial message was manipulated by government officials. They told him to read a message written by them, which they then edited to make it appear as if he was expressing his own opinion. And, well, it seems that the Mexican government wasn't pleased with his actions. June 27, 2014, Mireles, along with 45 others, was arrested in Lazaro Cárdenas, Michoacán, by Mexican authorities. Their arrest was based on the violation of Mexico's federal law of firearms and explosives. The government had made a commitment to apprehend armed civilians who weren't a part of the Fuerza Rural, or Rural Force, police. Despite being imprisoned, Mireles has managed to communicate with the nation through his former lawyer and the Grillo Notas YouTube channel. In a message released in 2015, he boldly declared, Not only is Manuel Mireles innocent, but all self-defense members who had the bare arms to protect their homes, families, and properties, as there was no one else to assist them. 2016. Things took a turn when Mireles decided to apologize to the government and his family for disrespecting official institutions in the country. He made a video statement on social media, expressing his sincere apologies to the Mexican government and the nation as a whole. And although the Attorney General dropped the charges against him, Mireles wasn't released from jail. May 11, 2017. Finally, after spending nearly three years behind bars, a federal judge granted him parole. Once he was set free, Mireles chose to keep a low profile, avoiding the limelight and any unnecessary attention. November 25, 2020, a Mexican government agency confirmed the passing of Mireles, who was 62 years old at the time. He had succumbed to the effects of COVID-19. Despite being a charismatic and local hero, Mireles may have had a few skeletons in his closet. Some media outlets claim that back in 1988, when he was just 20 years old, he spent time in prison for supposedly growing marijuana. However, Mireles denied that and insisted that he was actually imprisoned for practicing medicine in Michoacan without a valid state license. Additionally, Mireles faced accusations of domestic violence from his first wife and two of his children. These allegations were investigated, but Mireles was never formally charged. Despite all the controversies and legal troubles, Mireles will always be remembered for his bravery in taking on Mexico's notoriously violent cartels. He was willing to do what most people were too afraid to do. But Mireles wasn't the only one brave enough to do so. However, the next vigilante on the list chose a different path from the one our good doctor took. Number 4. Papa Smurf Another important leader of the community self-defense forces in Michoacan and Guerrero, Estanislao Beltran Torres, who was nicknamed Papa Smurf due to his long white beard. Papa Smurf took over as the main leader when Mireles got injured in that plane crash. Although Beltran Torres was charismatic, he didn't possess the same leadership skills as the doctor, and he started losing control of the autodefensas. When the government ordered them to disarm and join the rurales, Beltran Torres decided to comply. But what exactly was the rurales? May 2014. The regional government of Michoacan began distributing blue uniforms and assault rifles to vigilantes associated with the auto defenses. These vigilantes were meant to become part of a new rural police organization that would assist the armed forces in combating organized crime in the area. 
During mass ceremonies, around 3,300 vigilantes were officially sworn in by the local government. On that day, Papa Smurf, the leader of the vigilantes, declared that their battle against the cartels had just begun. We're not doing anything illegal. With this change, we are now part of the government. However, the truth in that statement wasn't entirely true. Once the vigilantes were officially sworn in, the authorities wasted no time in making a bold announcement. Anyone caught illegally carrying weapons in the state of Michoacan would face immediate arrest. Dr. Mireles, being one of the first to oppose this decision, found himself in hot water. He was promptly arrested and eventually succumbed to the immense pressures exerted by the government, as I mentioned earlier. However, under the leadership of Papa Smurf, an astonishing number of over 20,000 vigilantes eagerly joined the police force. In the short term, the vigilantes, working hand-in-hand -hand with heavily armed police and soldiers, achieved remarkable success. They managed to drive out cartel gunmen from one town after another, effectively restoring a basic sense of security for terrified residents. Unfortunately, though, as time went on, internal tensions and infighting between different factions began to plague the new movement, and the divide between vigilantes and Mexican authorities turned out to be more about just a uniform. Towards the end of 2014, the army made an attempt to disarm certain members of the citizen militia. This resulted in a heated confrontation, in which soldiers fired upon civilians, killing two in the process. However, despite the large number of vigilantes who cooperated with the authorities, the Alto Defensas managed to maintain a strong sense of unity over the years when it came to driving out the cartel gunmen. And now let's shift our focus to another important leader within the Alto Defensas. Number 3. Hippolito Mora 2013. Hippolito Mora, a Mexican farmer and politician, decided to take matters into his own hands. Frustrated with the rampant cartel activity in his town of La Ruana, he decided to form a vigilante self-defense group. The notorious Knights Templar cartel had been causing havoc in the region with kidnappings, threats, and controlling the lime industry that local farmers relied on. What pushed Hippolito over the edge was when the criminals actually forbade his son from picking lemons on their own farm. That was the last straw. He declared war on the drug cartels and began fighting them relentlessly, without any help from the outside. But things took a turn for the better when Mexican troops finally came to their aid. Together, they managed to drive out the cartel from Michoacan. While many fighters left La Ruana after the cartel's expulsion, Hippolito stayed behind, determined to rebuild and ensure a safer future for his community. His bravery and dedication caught the attention of the federal government, and he soon found himself with close ties to senior military officials and the federal police. His collaboration became crucial in locating laboratories for the production of synthetic drugs. As a result, he became a frequent go-to for the authorities, always ready to share valuable information. 2014, following the chaotic events surrounding Dr. Mireles' arrest and the deal made by Papa Smurf with the authorities, certain figures within Auto Defensas had to step forward and take charge of this group. One of these figures was Hippolito Mora Chavez. However, Mora wasn't the only one vying for leadership. Luis Antonio Torres, also known as El Americano, had founded his own group of vigilantes and desired to assume control as well. This led to an intense rivalry between Mora and El Americano. Early 2014, Mora was arrested on suspicion of involvement in the murder of two gunmen loyal to El Americano. However, he was released due to insufficient evidence. Mora accused El Americano of working for the Knights Templar, while El Americano made similar accusations against Mora. As their feud continued, tragedy became inevitable. December 16, 2014 a two-hour gun battle erupted between gunmen from two rival vigilante groups. The clash resulted in the deaths of 11 individuals, including six of El Americano's followers and five gunmen loyal to Mora, including his own son. Despite the loss of his son, Mora refused to back down and continued his war against the cartels, both on the battlefield and through media channels. 
He also became involved in politics, consistently advocating for stronger laws against drug cartels. In 2021, he became the gubernatorial nominee for the Solidarity and Counterparty in the Michoacan elections. On June 29, 2023, Mora tragically lost his life at the age of 67 in a brutal armed attack. He was ambushed and shot while traveling in an armored truck, which was later set ablaze. The assailants used beret rifles, which were powerful enough to penetrate the truck's armor. But who killed Mora and why? I'll reveal that later in the video, so stay tuned. Up till now, we've discussed autodefensas and the brave Mexican civilians who stood up against the cartels. But what about their counterparts on the other side of the border? Number 2. Tim the Nailer there's a stereotype surrounding the civilians who patrol the U.S. border, and Tim Naylor Foley perfectly fits that mold. He's a weathered, divorced ex-military man in his 60s who lost everything during the 2008 economic crash. Now he spends his days patrolling the Arizona border with a group of like-minded volunteers who believe that the region is not as secure as the media and government claim it to be. 2011. Foley made the decision to leave his home state of California and relocate to Arizona. It was there that he established the Arizona Border Recon Group AZBR. Initially, he found a few other men who shared that interest in patrolling the border, and he offered to help renovate the house they used as their base. Within a few short years, AZBR grew from a mere 30 volunteers to an impressive count of 200 individuals from all corners of the country. These volunteers included both farmer soldiers and civilians with no military experience, all united by their desire to contribute to the security of the U.S. border. AZBR goes on an operation approximately once every other month. Foley sends out an email six weeks in advance to inform volunteers and typically 15 to 30 individuals from across the country to join him for a week-long patrol. They begin by establishing a base camp, setting up communications, and organizing camping gear before Foley outlines their surveillance strategy. Their primary objective is to apprehend drug traffickers who frequently cross the border between U.S. and Mexico. However, the vigilante group has faced criticism over the years for detaining and holding civilians along the border without facing any legal charges. During an interview, Foley emphasized that their focus is solely on capturing drug mules, as he describes them. He stated, there are no women and children out here. They are males, very fit, ranging from their mid-twenties to early forties. I've seen some of them on my camera countless times. They're professionals. They do this for a living. Foley also estimates that the group rescues approximately a dozen people each year who have been abandoned by the guides hired by many undocumented individuals to help them cross the border. He claimed that the group provided them with water and food before handing them over to Border Patrol. However, that wasn't the only occasion when the group faced scrutiny. August 2019, Joshua Pritchard was extremely eager to join Arizona Border Recon. Maybe just a little too eager, I must say. Pritchard drove for over seven hours from his home in San Diego to a secluded outpost in the southern Arizona desert. He brought along a silencer and an illegal short-barreled rifle. Despite his excitement to participate in his first mission, things quickly took a turn when Foley informed him that he couldn't use a silencer on his weapons during patrols. Pritchard became visibly angry when Foley explained that militia members weren't allowed to physically restrain unauthorized migrants. Consequently, this outburst marked the end of Pritchard's first and last border reconnaissance mission with the group, as Foley promptly kicked him out. However, this incident didn't stop the determined San Diego resident from making the long drive to the Arizona borderlands again. Little did he know that one of the individuals present during his sole outing with the Arizona Border Recon was an informant for the government. This informant tipped off the FBI, leading to an investigation into Pritchard. As a result of this investigation, Pritchard was sentenced to over six years in prison. Prosecutors described his activities as running a firearms and ammunitions factory out of his house. Despite his previous felony convictions, which prohibited him from owning guns, Pritchard had taken matters into his own hands and started manufacturing his own firearms. 
In one recorded conversation, he even admitted, They just get addicted and you can't stop. Thankfully, Foley saw through Pritchard's behavior, because if he hadn't, a potential massacre might have occurred right there at the Arizona border. Now let's venture across the border once again to explore a brand new Mexican vigilante group that has pushed the boundaries to a whole new level. And number one, El Machete. July 2021, the indigenous people of Chiapas State in southern Mexico followed in the footsteps of the Zapatista rebels by taking up arms. However, this time their motive was to combat the organized crime gangs that have been causing havoc in their communities. At first glance, this group bears a resemblance to the hooded Zapatistas, who made international headlines in 1994 when they emerged from the jungle, capturing towns and clashing with security forces to fight for indigenous rights. Yet, according to an online manifesto attributed to the group known as El Machete, their mission is to be a modern-day David battling the Goliath, represented by drug traffickers and hired killers. Their manifesto states their desire for peace, democracy, and justice. But what led to the formation of El Machete? In the town of Panteo, Mexico, a faction led by the Herrera family had emerged from the ranks of paramilitary groups. Allegedly, they're involved in a wide range of criminal activities, including drugs and arms trafficking, auto theft, and illegal land occupation. Local residents accuse him of being responsible for the deaths of at least 200 people in the area over the past two decades. Although the gang's patriarch, Ostroberto Herrera, was arrested on murder charges in 2019, the locals claim that his sons took over, and the violence continued without any interruption. Additionally, Los Herrera seemed to have found a powerful ally in the town's mayor. Leading up to the 2021 election, Los Herrera engaged in a campaign of intimidation on behalf of their allies in the Party of the Democratic Revolution, or PRD. They didn't mince words and issued a clear warning. If the people didn't vote for the PRD, they would face serious consequences. These threats were not empty promises. In early May, Los Herrera allegedly killed an indigenous man in his cornfield as a way to instill fear and set an example, according to the residents. Within days, armed villagers from the same community where the man was killed clashed with alleged members of Los Herrera in a shootout. Reportedly, two gang members were killed in the attack. This shootout marked the turning point and the official beginning of El Machete. Before dawn on July 7th, heavily armed members of El Machete set up blockades along the road leading to the center of Pantero. This ended up causing random shootouts between them and Los Herrera all day long. Terrified, bewildered, and scared by their past experiences, approximately 6,000 residents hastily fled up to the mountains, seeking refuge in schools and churches in nearby towns. The following morning, state security forces dispatched to restore order were unexpectedly ambushed by El Machete at one of the blockades. This confrontation resulted in nine military and police officers sustaining injuries, but El Machete eventually retreated, allowing the security forces to regain control of the town. July 10th, the members of the militia emerged from the shadows, presenting a video statement to clarify their motives and objectives. A masked representative of El Machete expressed, Our intention was not to harm the people, but rather to expel the assassins, drug traffickers, and organized crime. We took action because we cannot bear any more loss of life. However, the reality was far from what they claimed. From March to the first week of July, 12 individuals, including a minor, lost their lives, and another person went missing. Moreover, the violence in the Chiapas region forced an additional 3,000 people to flee their homes. Not only that, but the vigilante group was also held responsible for burning numerous vehicles and at least a dozen homes. They also vandalized the town, abducting 21 individuals. It was believed these abducted residents were taken to the San Jose Buena Vista Tercero, the alleged base of operations for the vigilante group. 
In response to these accusations, a young masked man, believed to be associated with El Machete, defiantly stated, We left the homes of the narcos and assassins just as they left our family members when they killed them and stole their land. At the start of the video, I mentioned that these stories would make you question the concept of good versus evil. So, now we're curious. Have they? I also made you another promise, which was to uncover the mystery surrounding Hippolito Mora's unfortunate demise. Well, here it is. A not-so-honorable mention. Another key leader in the community self-defense forces of Michoacan and Guerrero was Nicolas Sierra Santana, also known as El Gordo. Originally, El Gordo was a member of a faction within the Knights Templar Cartel. However, he swiftly switched sides and joined the Auto Defense Us when he witnessed the decline of the Knights Templar's influence. Troubled brew when the Mexican government issued an order for the Auto Defense Us to disarm, leading to the arrest of Dr. Mireles. In response, El Gordo, along with numerous former Auto Defensas, decided to form their own drug cartel called Los Viagras. This cartel has since gained notoriety for its connections in rivalry with the infamous Jalisco New Generation Cartel. One of Los Viagras' most famously reported homicidal acts stems from a viral video from 2014, famously known as No Mercy in Mexico, where they have two victims tied up a father and a son in the outdoors. They began by beating the two with a wooden stick, before potating the father as the son cried beneath the cloth wrapped around his mouth. It's then that they hold the father's decapitated head and proceed to reveal the cartel's name, Los Viagras. Once they finished with the father, they proceeded to stab and slash at the son while he remained alive. The motive for this double homicide, as stated in the video, is believed to be homicidal revenge. Allegedly, the two victims had shared confidential information with a rival gang, which led to their tragic demise. Plus, one of the Sicarios from the group was arrested and charged in February 2019 for allegedly committing numerous murders. This highlights even more the group's complete disregard for boundaries and their extreme brutality. However, the question still remains, how were they involved in Mora's murder? Despite the lack of immediate arrests following the attack, various versions quickly surfaced regarding the possible culprits. This was largely due to Hippolito Mora's anticipation of such an event. During a conversation with a journalist, the former self-defense leader revealed that the Los Viagras cartel had declared war on him. This was in response to Mora's decision to disclose the location of several drug laboratories in the state to the Ministry of the Interior. Additionally, Mora and El Gordo had a history, and Mora had a deep disdain for him. El Gordo had betrayed the auto defensas and became part of the very thing they were fighting against. Also, according to Guadalupe Mora, the sister of Hippolito Mora, it seems that the National Guard, the Civil Guard, and the Army were somehow involved in her brother's murder. She claims that during the attack, there wasn't a single soldier or patrol in sight, leaving him completely vulnerable. To make matters worse, it appeared that uniformed officers stationed nearby took their sweet time responding to the calls for help, taking more than a half an hour to arrive at the scene. And well, guess what? El Gordo, the notorious criminal, seems to have a knack for manipulating the police to do his bidding. April 2020, the Secretary of National Defense managed to apprehend El Gordo's right-hand man, La Serena, after a clash in Buena Vista. However, they shockingly released him when they stumbled upon a convoy of El Gordo's henchmen on the Apanzigan Aguilia Highway. Honestly, after learning all of this, I think the enigma surrounding Mora is no longer a mystery. And well, that's all for today's video. But if you still want more, there's a story of a brave 77-year-old man who fearlessly stood up against one of Mexico's deadliest cartels all on his own. If you want to find out what happened to him, watch this video.